Alright, so um, today we are going to go into Ezra chapter 3, and um, what, are we gonna, what we're going to do is, we're going to do, let's, so let, let's, let's, let's recap where we are and then we'll open in prayer. Um, Ezra chapter 3, so we've, we've got the people of Israel that are, that have been in captivity in Babylon for 70 years. Now they've come back. And so the first chapter 1, and it breaks down, the, the breakdown of the book is really pretty simplistic and it's easy to follow. So chapter 1 is the proclamation. That's when God moves Cyrus, the Persian king, and says, says I want you to go back to Jerusalem. In fact, I want, I want you to look at that in chapter 1. This is, going to, this is an important part of this. Go to Ezra chapter 1 and look at the decree of Cyrus. And look what he says in verse, verse 3. Any of his people, talking about the Jews, among you uh, may his God be with him and go up to Jerusalem and Judah, and here's the key, and build the house of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. So that's the decree. Now, when you're the Persian king... And you make a decree to build the house of the Lord, you are supposed to do what? Build the house of the Lord. And we'll just keep that in the back of your mind because that's going to play in as we get in the story. We get in chapter 4, it's going to start getting a little more complicated as we do that. So, um, so he makes a proclamation. Chapter 2 was all about the 50,000 people. And again, I think the key is go back to chapter 2 of Ezra and look at, the, look at this verse. This is the key to the verse, the key to the chapter. In chapter 2, it says that, in chapter 2, no, sorry, chapter 1, uh, chapter 1, 5 says, And the family heads of Judah and Benjamin, so we know it's the two southern tribes coming back, along with the priests and Levites, everyone whose spirit God had roused. So God roused some spirits to go back, and others he did not. So we get an idea of the people that are going back, and they're by clans, and it's important to understand the reason that they're by clans first and then families is that they're going back to where they came from. Okay, so if you go and you look in the back of your Bible in your map section, you'll have a map somewhere that shows when God gave them the promised land and they came into the promised land, that, they, that the Israel is divided up by the 12 tribes or where they go. So people were coming back going to their own cities, their own towns, some of which would have been from Jerusalem, but Benjamin and Judah are the two tribes. So we're going to pick up there, and chapter 3, in which we are today, is about worship being restored. So um, let's open up in prayer, and then we'll dive into the lesson. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity to come together. And Lord, um, as we study your word today, we see the importance of your people coming back to Jerusalem to, for, for a very specific reason, to worship you. And Lord, that's why we're here today. We're here to learn about you. But most importantly, we're here to worship you through our study of your word, to worship you through our singing and praising, and worshiping you into the study of the word in the sanctuary later on. So Father, I ask that you would open our hearts and minds this morning. Lord, you know all the burdens and things that I got on my mind today. And Lord, as I prayed this morning, take those off for now, Lord. I'll deal with those later on, but now I need to open your word and I need to glean from that and I need to be able to stand on it and learn from it. Father, be with us this day as we honor those people that serve us, Lord, which is following a very Christ-like principle because you came to serve and not to be served. So Father, be with us as we study your lesson today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So one of the things we're going to talk a lot about today is this word restore, restore or restoration. Because what God has done is He's punished His people, for lack of a better term, He's punished His people with seven years of captivity for their sins, for things they did wrong, after He kept telling them, please stop, turn, turn, turn. We have prophet after prophet after prophet. So if you go, if you got the chart, and I have extras if anybody would like one. So if you look at this chart, that I gave, and I'm sorry, I don't have it on the blow-up. But in the middle, these are all the prophets right here. This line is where all the prophets. And if you look at this, all these prophets through here, in essence, they're all saying the exact same thing. Repent. Repent before the Lord gets frustrated and does what? Sends you into 70 years of captivity. 
They keep saying it again and again and again. And they said it to, to the northern, ten northern tribes who were taken over by the Assyrians and were gone. So what we're going to do today, a little bit different, is uh, we're going to go through kind of a breakdown of the, the 13 verses in the chapter, kind of give an overview of what was going on, what was really happening, and then what we'll do is we'll take that and we'll bust that in to say, well, how does this apply to us? Why do we need to study it? And, and is there something for us to glean out of here that can get us in better relation with the Lord? And I think there is. So, the question becomes today, after God chastened His people for 70 years, how do you restore, how did they restore themselves back to, so they got to return, they got to come back to the Lord, right? And then they also have to be restored in fellowship with Him. And what we're going to do is look at that and, and, and do it as an analogy for us when we drift from the Lord. When we, when we do things that God we know doesn't want us to do and we've kind of gotten away from Him. How do we come back in? And I think what we'll see here today is we'll use Israel as an example of that. And what we're going to see is they did um, five things. They gathered, they worshipped, they celebrated, they worked, and they sang. And so we'll use that as a breakdown of that. So what they did when they, they accomplished their first kind of three minor goals when they got back to the land. They rebuilt the altar, which we'll look at. They went through the festival, or went through the, the festival or feast of the tabernacles or shelters, and then they started construction of the temple of God's house. Because remember, the altar is not God's house. The altar is a part of God's house. God's house, and which was the proclamation, was what to build or rebuild God's house, which is His temple. Because it's not the, the, the altar is where they make the sacrifice, so they've got to have the altar to make the sacrifice, but they've got to have the temple for God to dwell in. So here's what we'll do. We'll take the chapter, and we're going to break it down by verse and kind of give an outline of what's going on in those verses, and then we'll come back and tear it apart. So um, the title today is Worship Restored. So what do they do? First thing, verse 1, somebody want to read verse 1, is they gather gathering together. Verse 1, chapter 3. And when the seventh month was come and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Okay. So, in other words, in, in, in the key here we're going to see the seventh month, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, So you see, they've come back, they've gone to their own towns, and they've done all of these things, they've gotten reestablished, and then it says what? Now when the seventh month came, and the seventh month we'll talk about, it's a very important month from a feast and festival perspective of the Jews in Jerusalem. It says, the sons of Israel were in their cities, in their individual cities, and they did what? They came back together in Jerusalem, but here's the thing, they came back unified as one man. So they come back as a one group. We're coming here not for our own individual needs. We're coming here to do what? To worship. Now we worship individually, but we worship corporately. That's why we come together. If there was no, if God didn't intend for corporate worship, A, He wouldn't have us gather together. Why would He do that? We just all would individually worship. So that's it. Uniting as one man is the first key. All right. Now hold on and think about that because what we're ultimately going to put this to is restoration for us when we fail. So we're going to come back and use that to tie in. Now, verses 2 and 3 is worshiping together. Would somebody want to read those, verse 2 and 3? Then arose Joshua, the son of Josiah, with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltel with his kinsmen, and they built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it. It is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set the altar in this place, but fear was on them because of the peoples of the land, so they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. All right, so what we see there is they gathered together, First, what did they do? They came together as one to do what? To worship together. And the first thing they did was build the altar because without the altar, they couldn't approach God 
or expect His blessing because why? Because sin is separating them from God. So they've got to have the altar to do what? To make sacrifices so that God can do what? God can turn around and bless them. And it's a great illustration of Matthew 6.33 which says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. You know what they were doing? They were seeking Him first. The first thing they did when they gathered together, they looked around and they said, we can't worship without an altar because we can't approach God without, without the repentance and forgiveness of our sins. Well, we can't do that until we, put this, the, until we have an altar to make sacrifices on. So that's what they did. But it's interesting. And verse 3 is the key to the later chapter because it says, they set up the foundation for, now watch this, for they were very terrified of the peoples of the lands. So these are the people that... It, Backfilled, they vacuumed when, every, when Nebuchadnezzar took the Jews away. Here's all this place, even though Jerusalem was ruined, and it got backfilled by the Samaritans and all the other pagans that were around them. And they had fear, they were actually in fear, and so what did they do? They, instead of setting up, isn't it interesting? They didn't set up an army first. First thing they did is said, Who would protect us most, an army or God? God called us back here. So we got to rebuild this thing. So, then. Somebody read 14 or 4 through chapter or verses 4 through 7. And that is celebrating <clears throat> together. And they celebrated the feast of booths as it is written and offered the fixed number of burnt offerings daily according to the ordinance as each day required. And afterward, there was a continual burnt offering also for the new moons and for all the fixed festivals of the Lord that were consecrated, and from everyone who offered a free will offering to the Lord. From the first, when do, how do I, where do I go to? Seven. Seven. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord had not been laid. Then they gave money to the masons and carpenters and food, drink, and oil to the Sidonians and to the Tyrians to bring cedar wood from Lebanon to the Sea of Joppa according to the permission they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. Okay, so <clears throat> this is a big thing, and we'll talk about this in, 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 in a few minutes. So what did they do? They, they gathered together. They got the altar built so they could worship together. And then once they had the altar built, then they could do what? They could celebrate together. And so what they're going to do is they're going to celebrate this feast called the, the feast or festival of it's, it's Sukkot, S-U-K-K-O-T, or booths or shelters or in-gatherings. There's multiple words for it that can go through. But it's really important. Minor things are important. So when you go back to verse 1 of chapter 3, it says, Now when the seventh month came. So that means they were there before the seventh month. But when they got to the seventh month, it was really, really important because the seventh month, which is which we are in now, the seventh month of the Jewish calendar, we're in now, and we talked about a couple of weeks ago, which was, we started with Yom Kippur, you had Rosh Hashanah, then Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, and that's the tenth of the, the month. And then the fifteenth of the month, five days later, is when you start the festival of um, Sukkot or Tabernacles or Booths or whatever. We'll talk about why that is. But that is the biggest, most, Im most important, probably in right, but is the, is the biggest feast or festival of the Jewish calendar. Because number one, it's seven days long, can be nine days, where most every other feast is a day or two. So seven to nine days long, and we'll talk about why that is, but it is a huge, huge week of celebration. And... The feast, of the, the feast of Tabernacles in the Jewish calendar started Friday. So we're right at the very beginning of that week-long celebration. And we'll talk about why that's important and why it's important to us as Christians. Very interesting when we get that. So then, um, the, the next thing to do, somebody read verses 8 through 10. Now they start working together. <clears throat> Participation class. <laughs> Eight now, ten. now in the second year of their coming, uh, excuse me, now in the second year of their coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month began Zerubbabel and the son of Zechariah and Jeshua, 
and the son of Zod. Zehozadak. And the remnant of the brethren and the feast of the Levites and all they that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem and appoint, appointed the Levites from 20 years ago and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. Then stood Jehazia with his sons, his brethren, Cadmiel and his sons of Jews, Judah, together to set forward the workmen in the house of God and the sons of Janadah with their sons and their brethren of the Levites. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets and with the, and the Levites and the sons of Aspa and symbols oh, and with with symbols to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David king of Israel. All right. So what are they doing? Now they begin to work together. You can see it's in now in the second year of coming to the house of God at Jerusalem. So they had to get back, get established, right? Because they, they had this long journey back after 70 years of captivity. And so they come back, and what do they do? They start to build this thing. Now they got the altar built. That was the first thing. Now what they got to do is now they got to start building the temple. And in order to build the temple, the first thing you have to do is you have to lay the foundation. And so they got the workmen together, and they began to do these things. And the Scripture is what gave them everything they needed to do. If you went back to verse 2, how did they know how to build the altar? The altar of the house of Israel to offer burnt offerings as it is written in the law of Moses. In other words, they went back to the book. And the book's going to tell them what to do. And it's interesting because when you go down here, now in verse 8 or 10, it says, when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with their trumpets and the Levites and the sons and the symbols and the praise. Well, what that is referencing back to is if you go back to Leviticus, all of the, look, go back, that's where all the crazy detail that most of us have never even read, maybe glanced through, how they had to have their robes and everything with the golden threads and the, uh, the red thread, everything had to be, what was that? And the blue thread. Yeah, everything. They had to have everything just exactly right. So they've been working all this time to get everything right because once they start laying the foundation of the house of the Lord, all these things, they've got to go back and see what the book says. And follow it according to the book. Because guess what? They hadn't been doing it for 70 years. So they got to go back and do what the book says. And that's going to be important in a few minutes and we'll see why. So the foundation is important. Laying the foundation of the temple. It also references to the foundation that we have. What kind of foundation do you have? Because guess what? The stronger your foundation is, when the world comes around to you and begins to shake at you, if your foundation is strong, what's the song say? All others are sinking sand. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the solid rock I stand. It was coming to me. It was back there spinning around. Right? That's what it is. Oh, if your foundation is built well. So it's very important. Minor details in the scriptures. They had to build the foundation to the altar. Then they had to build the foundation to that. And then we'll see later on as that uh, comes together. Then, ver then we'll close out the chapter. Verses 11 through 13. They're doing what? Singing together. They sang, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His loving kindness is upon Israel forever. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Yet many of the priests and Levites and the heads of fathers' households, the old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes while many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the shout of joy from the sound of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard far away. All right. Isn't it interesting that we come back together to sing, to sing and they're doing what? They're singing and worshiping and praising, praise God. And they're in the middle of this bombed out city. That's what it is. The walls are down, the buildings are down, the temple's down. They built an altar, which is, you know, this is an altar. They built this. All they've done is lay the foundation to the temple. And guess what happens? The old men looked back and wept. The young looked ahead and rejoiced. 
Because what they saw was the temple was coming. That was what's most important. They saw the temple coming. Be careful when you start working and looking at things out of your past. Lest they rob you of a glorious future. Amen. You can't change your past, but the past can change you. Are you going to be better? Or are you going to be bitter? The old men were bitter. The young men were better. It's like, hey, we got a, we got a foundation. That means well, all we got to do is start building up, and next thing you know, we'll have a temple. Here's a couple of things to think about. The past can be a rudder that guides you or an anchor that hinders you. Hmm. Or it can be an iceberg that can sink you. Leave your past mistakes with God and look into the future by faith. That's what they were doing. They were looking into the future. You know, so you got the old guys, well, this is not looking like anything it used to be. And young guys are going, but it's better than what, we, what was here when we got here. At least we got a foundation laid. I can see the future. I can see it coming. The project won't be complete. And see, here it is. And this is what I want you to see. It's a spiritual building process for us. We're not going to be complete until we get to glory, right? So the process is always being built. 1 Peter 2.5 says, you also, talking about us, and again, takes you right back to this foundational, literally foundational piece in the temple. 1 Peter 2.5 says, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. Why? Watch this. To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. See the see see how that all pulls together. All of those things got to come together so we get it. So we're under construction, man. We're we're building process, and that's what we're going to continue to hang on. Raymond, so. Raymond, the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem is that part of the foundation from this temple or another temple? Uh, not this temple because this temple got knocked. Well, no, it is Zerubbabel's temple. No, it's not. Got knocked down by uh, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes in 16 BC. And so then you have huh, your Solomon's temple, Zerubbabel's temple, and then Herod's, Herod's temple. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. yeah. Then Herod's temple. Herod's temple got built in 16 BC and then got destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD when they just got mad. Done, done, done with the Jews at that point. Isn't it inter interesting that the, 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 the first temple was filled with opulence and, and all of this stuff to get to the Holy of Holies. But this one here, he started with shedding of blood. Yeah. And everything built from that. That's exactly right, Jim. Started with the shedding of blood. Yep. Because where does our foundation start? It starts with the shedding of blood. blood. Bingo. I, we're done now. Yep. That's it. Coffee and donuts, man. Okay. Return and restoration. God uses this return to reestablish His people to do what? To worship Him amidst the rubble which had once been Jerusalem. So, there are times in our lives when we need to return and restore our relationship with God. Right? Maybe you fail the Lord terribly in some situation. Uh, maybe through intentional rebellion and sin, you've turned your back. Perhaps you drifted, just, just drifted into Babylon. And remember, when we talk about Babylon, yes, Babylon was a real city, right? A real country, really a city within the country. But the Babylonians, uh, but when we look at and you go through Scripture, even in, in the book of Revelation, Babylon represents the world. Worldliness and all the things that go around it. So perhaps you've drifted back into Babylon because we all came out of Babylon. It's easy to drift back into it. Maybe there was a disappointment or a trial that's caused you to drift from close fellowship with the Lord. You need to do what? You need to return to Him. You've got to come forward. He's waiting. He's never left. He's waiting. And you come forward and then you do what? And here's the key. You return and then you allow Him to restore you. Well, try to restore yourself on your own. And we're going to use these examples of coming together where you do what? Where you're going to have you, as He restores you, by gathering back together with the people of God. By worshiping together with the people of God. By celebrating, by working together, by singing praises and thanksgiving together. That's where we come back. Hosea 6, it's 1 through 3. You know, Hosea is a great book because when you start looking at all these prophets, all through here, you know, all these prophets through here. And you know, I know you've read a lot of them, read parts of them, and some are very 
way out here and you know do I really understand the mysticism not mysticism do I really understand in this language what he's trying to teach us and then what happens is if you look at where Hosea is Hosea is right here when the northern tribes go into captivity and so I always look at Hosea it's kind of funny it's like God says, okay, I've given you all these prophets. They've had a lot of words, but maybe it was really high theology and it's hard to understand. So let me give you Hosea because everybody will understand Hosea. Hosea was married to a prostitute. And he kept loving her and she kept doing what? Prostituting herself. And then he'd take her back. And she'd prostitute herself again. So it's like God finally said, instead of high theology, I'll give you something everybody can understand. A cheating spouse. He says, that's what you are to me. In Hosea 6, at the end of, which I think is the last chapter of Hosea, don't quote me on that. So chapter 6, 1 through 3 says, Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us, but He will heal us. He has wounded us, but He will bind up our wounds. He will revive us after two days, and on the third day He will raise us up so we can live in His presence. You see the analogies coming through there? Let us strive to know the Lord. Here it is. You got to return and you have to strive. You have to do something. You can't just sit back. Let's strive to know the Lord. His appearance is as sure as the dawn. In other words, if you come back to Him, He will be there as sure as the sun's coming up tomorrow morning. That's the provision. Does everybody believe the sun's coming up tomorrow morning? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well then, believe that when you come back to Him, He's like this. Right there with his arms open up. And he goes on in, in, in verse 3 says, He will come like the rain, like the spring showers that water the land. So you can do what? Growth, new, come forward again as a new plant. But where do you start? All you know is when you've, walked, when you've drifted from the Lord, at some point you get to the point where you realize that the idols of Babylon are not worth what they're giving you. You're dissatisfied. They were dissatisfied enough that they uprooted themselves, went on a long, perilous journey to get to a place that was destroyed. They weren't coming back to paradise. They weren't showing up at the Ritz Carlton. And we talked about this last week. If your sin has caused huge problems, when you, God will bring you back right from that, but you may still have to deal with the problems. He doesn't always just resolve the problems. One of the examples we use, if you, if you fall into the sin of debt and crash your world because of finances and debt, because you haven't followed a biblical principle, God will restore you, but it doesn't mean you might not have to deal with the mess. Or if you've allowed anger to ruin a family, right? God will restore you. You may still have to deal with the, the, the hurt that came out of that and the healing process that goes through it. But he is faithful to restore. So chapter 3 provides us, I think, four applications to how we find comfort and strength in this restoration. Number one, return and restoration with God are possible no matter how low we've gotten. I mean, the, these, the, 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 the kingdom, uh, the, the nation of Israel, the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom, got pretty low. They got so low that God destroyed his own temple. I mean, he, he allowed Nebuchadnezzar to do it. But he says, I've had enough of you people. I, and, and think about this now. It's not just 70 years of captivity. Where does God, where, at that point, where did God dwell with his people? In the temple. If no temple, God's not with them. God took his hands off. He said, go. You want, you, want, you want to do this on your own? Knock yourself out. See what happens. So we, what God did was, you can say, well, God maneuvered Nebuchadnezzar. Man, okay, probably. But really what God did was, He just said, I'll just take my hands of protection off of you. Let's see how good you're... How, how, you won't win your battles without me, is what He's saying. When, when Joshua brought the people into the promised land, and they conquered the promised land, did they conquer it because they were really good? No, they conquered it because God was really good. And He showed that by grand example. The first place they went to was Jericho. And you can see all the young bucks woo, in their armor, ready to go. Let's go fight. He says, hey, now nah, bring, bring, the, bring the band, bring the marching band out and have them walk around the city. Mm -hmm. Why? Because what he wanted to show them, he says, I will give this to you, not you. You won't give it to yourself. You can't. 50,000 Jews responded. They gave up their lives. They took this long, difficult journey. In the seventh month, which is September, October, which is where we are now, they went up to Jerusalem, 
the walls were torn down, the temple was busted, and hostile people had moved in. They were trying to get them going. And whether it's corporately or individually, the people had fallen into sin, and God promised to restore them. He actually told them through the prophet Jeremiah, I'll restore you after 70 years. 70 years later, what did he do? He got the pagan king to say, go back and rebuild God's temple. It's always God is a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Right? To the fallen and repentant King David, the Lord has taken away your sin. Second Samuel. Think about it. Uh, Jonah. When Jonah finally got vomited out of the fish, what happened? The word of the Lord came to him for the second time. Because you know what the first time he said? I'm not listening. I'm going this way. Right? God, once God did what? God got him in the belly of the fish, and then the fish finally vomited him up. He says, well, okay, now for the second time, the Lord came to him. Do you see the restoration? A weeping and broken Peter, right? Who had, who had, who had said, I don't know who this man is, right? The risen Savior re re restored him. God graciously offers restoration. So the question is, where do you start the restoration process? That's where I think we go back to this. We have to focus on the cross. Because what they did was they came together and they knew that they needed to do, get the worship. They gathered together and they knew the most important thing. They came together as one. They were unified. And then in order to worship, they had to do what? Watch, 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 watch. Go back to verse, go back to, uh, verse 2. They built the altar of God as it is written in the law of Moses. So what did the first thing they do? They came back to the book. So what do we do? The first things that the leaders, Jeshua and Zerubbabel did when they saw the pile was they stood up and they said, rebuild the altar. And then from, first, from, from verse 6, we learned that they did it prior to the first day of the seventh month, which is important, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, it was fundamental if they wanted to draw near to God was to, was to have the altar in place. What's fundamental for us, so how do we... When, when this restoration, we want restoration with God, what do we do? We focus on the cross, just like they focused on the book. We focus on the cross. In other words, back to basics. They went back to, okay, well, basics. First thing we've got to do, we're sinners separated from God, so we've got to build the altar. Yeah, because I've got to get rid of the sin, so I've got to get God not to see my sin, so I need to build the altar so I can do sacrifice. So what do we do with us? First thing we do is we go back and say, you know what? Let me think about what the Lord has done for me. The sacrifice that He did for me. The fundamental need is to draw near to God for the forgiveness of sins. The only way we can do that is to go back and remember what did God do for us. Coming to the altar, God said in, in Leviticus 1, He said the altar is one for bringing an offering that is acceptable to the Lord. In Exodus 29, He says about the altar, I will meet there with the sons of Israel. That's where He's going to meet. Where does He meet with us? At the foot of the cross. And we want to see us out running around, come to the foot of the cross, because that's where we started from. The sacrificial animals pointed to God's perfect once for all sacrifice, which was Christ. So if you're a believer and you've strayed from the Lord, the cross is the place for restoration. It's where it starts. 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, so what do we do? We come in to the altar, we confess our sins. He is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and cleanse us from our unrighteousness. You know, restoration, you could call restoration a cleansing from unrighteousness. In other words, we got the filth. We got the stink of sin on us. And he says, you come, you confess, I am faithful to forgive and do what? And cleanse you from your unrighteousness. In other words, I'll make you white as snow right again. One more time. Again and again. Amen. He'll do that. Restoration with God. Here's a third thing. Most focus on obedience to His Word. First thing, starts at the foot of the cross, and it's got to focus on obedience to His Word or truth. So, how did they know how to build the altar? Verse 2 says it was written in the Law of Moses. They came back to God's Word. How did they observe the Feast of Booths? Look at verse 4. As it is written according to the ordinance. Go back, look at verse 4. They celebrated the Feast of the Booths as it is written. Right? According to the ordinance. In other words, they went back and they did what God's Word said. So, they weren't making this stuff up according to what they thought. Well, you know, I think this is what we ought to maybe do. No! 
That's why it's important details. First of the seventh month. Wait a minute, that's a big, that's huge, because now they were going to be able to put what? To do sacrifices on the altar for Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. They celebrated that right here in the first chapter, or third chapter, which is what it is. Then, they didn't take a poll to find out what the people wanted to do. Well, what do y'all think? No, they went back to God's Word. They did it according to the ordinance that was there. Maybe the old way of worship wasn't in tune with the modern times. They said, well, I mean, do we really need a temple to worship God? If we just love Him... Right? We can't. No, no, no. No, he said, he said, go back to the book and do it. Maybe the younger generation want a more contemporary way of meeting with God. Hmm? Why not throw out the old and do something new? Well, maybe there were some people who said, you know, I think the Old Testament, I think God's Pentateuch is a changing, evolving thing. Maybe we don't need to make sacrifices anymore. Mm -mm. That's where you needed the old men that said, no way, we're going back to what the book says. We're not changing it up. So, um, they went back to the Word of God. The standard we need to evaluate anything and everything we do is does it line up with Scripture? And has God revealed it to us in His Word? Hmm. Does it promote the holiness of God's people in line with the Word? So let's talk about the Festival of Shelters for a minute. Biggest feast of the year, seven days long, started this past Friday. And um, what it is is it's called booths or shelters or sukkot, which is a covering and it is a reminder of God's provision for the people in the 40 years they were wandering in the wilderness. He kept a cover over them. And so literally what they would do is they would build these, I call them brush arbors, for lack of a better term. They'd build these brush arbors, and they would spend a week in these brush arbors celebrating, praising God. Can you imagine if we shut down for an entire week? And you know what else they would do with that? Is that it would give them the opportunities to go to other people's shelters and celebrate, and you know what they would do? They wouldn't go in and talk about who won the ball game yesterday. They'd go in and talk about, remember what God did for us? And then let me tell you what God did for me and my family. And they would share that around an entire week. It's Thanksgiving on steroids is what it is. <laughs> it's also one of the three feasts that's called a pilgrimage feast. So for the men of Israel, there are three feasts, uh, Passover, Pentecost, and booths where they're required to go to Jerusalem. In other words, it's that big a deal. Um, Jesus, in John 7, the entire chapter 7 of, of the book of John, the Gospel of John, is about Jesus where? At the Festival of Tabernacles, or the Festival of Booths, in Jerusalem. He was there celebrating it. It was huge. And there's a lot of analogy, because one of the things they would do is at night, they would light up with all these candles, around and so it shone on the temple it was really beautiful and Jesus in John chapter 7 says I am the light of the world because everybody would look at the temple it was the most glorious time to view the temple and then they would also the priest would go down to the, the, the pool of Siloam and they would bring this water the everlasting water and Jesus says in chapter 7 during the festival of feast he says I am the living water so see what he was doing? He was substituting himself. He was showing, I am the substitute for everything that you're doing to show God. I'm going to fulfill. So Jesus, you hear the, top, the topic or the theme, Jesus fulfills the prophecy of the Old Testament. He does. And he fulfills the festival of the booths because he says, I replace it. And what's interesting is if you go to Zechariah 14, it says, it says that in the millennial reign... In the future, in the millennial reign, we will celebrate that. Think about it. Um, it foreshadows his shelter of us in the new Jerusalem. That's what it does. It's an interesting time. So when it comes to how we should live as God's people, we must go to God's word and obey what he commands. That's why restoration with God must focus on obedience to his word. God's moral commandments do not adapt to changing moral standards of our times. This is not an, an evolutionary thing. In fact, God has not softened his views on premarital sex or on homosexuality in spite of what our modern society says. So we have to be people of the book. If you want a restoration with God, begin at the cross and then walk in obedience to his word. Fourthly, and then we'll break this one down further. Restoration with God must focus on building his house. Okay. So if we're going to focus on building his house. So if we look at verse 6. Verse 6. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to burnt offerings 
but the foundation of the temple of the Lord had not been laid. So, verse 7, they begin to resolve. They look around, well, well, we've got to start with the foundation. So, verse 7, what do they do? They gave money to masons and carpenters and food and drink and oil to these folks. They had to get, if you go back and you read, they had to go to Lebanon to get the cedars of Lebanon because it's part of what God's book, what the Word said was supposed to be done through that. So, they had to lay, this, they had to lay the, the, the foundation down. It's interesting. It's um, interesting. The, the temple or the house of God is referenced in chapter 3 in verse 6, verse 9, verse 10, twice in verse 8, verse 11, and twice in verse 12. Think it's an important thing to get the house of the God built? The temple of the house of the was a place where God dwelled among His people and it manifested His glory. The people went there to offer sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins, but also for thanksgiving for the goodness that He has done to Him. That's the thing that the, the the place for corporate worship, and again we have the three times that we do there, and then um, Cyrus decreed what we saw Cyrus decreed in chapter one: build the house. The restored nation couldn't properly worship God or praise Him without His house being rebuilt. So it's really important. So now we're God's church, we're His temple, we're His house individually, right? We don't have to have that to go to. But, when, but we need to remember that the place, this building, isn't sacred, right? The people are sacred. And that's interesting because if you think about it, what that means is our brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to look at them as sacred temples of the Lord. And if you look at it and you do the analogy of a building, if they saw part of the building, the temple building, crumbling, well, they just look and go, yeah, it looks like that thing's going to fall apart after a while. No! Hey, come along today, Kevin. Come on, man. We got to get up there and get that thing fixed. We can't have that happening. Well, the same thing we ought to have with our brothers and sisters in Christ. See, we come together, we gather together as one. Why? So that if we see an individual as part of the gathering of one that's starting to crumble, we're there what? We're there to get together and build them back up. The foundation's there. That's what we have to do. That's the example of what this is. So we use the idea of a, an analogy of a building and we pull it back to us. We have to gather. That's why isn't it isn't interesting. They gathered together. They worshiped together. They celebrated together. They worked together. They sang together. Is there anything they didn't do together? Not really. The application is if we need restoration with God, don't try to do it on your own. And of course, and there's a sense a new beginning must be it must begin privately, right? You have to go to the Lord in private and confess your sins and personally appropriate the shed blood of Jesus. But Scripture also says in the New Testament, confess your sins to one another, right? Why? Because it lifts the burden off of you. And sometimes you need that not just the burden lifted off of you, you need your brother or sister in Christ by confessing it to him. What you're saying is, will you help pray and hold me accountable to this? All right? we, I'm really struggling with pick your sin. You know, it can be a, a, see, we want to rank. Oh, these are really bad sin, but the anger and things. Hey, you know, those, no, they're all the same. Sin is sin. So we have to look at it that way. You have to personally get into God's Word and begin to obey it in your daily life, through your thought life. But once you've begun to renew in private, you need to build together with others who have a commitment to God who will help lift you up. All right? Without the commitment to other believers, is my opinion, Babylon will overwhelm you. We all get overwhelmed by Babylon. So if restoration must focus on building the house, how do we do it? And I think we have, our, we, we have the example here in these verses. Building God's house requires the courage to stand together against the hostile world. So to build his house, we'll put some more here. We have to stand against Babylon, which again, Babylon represents the world. <clears throat> they rebuilt the house of God. Why? Because they were terrified of the peoples of the land. That's what verse 3 says. These words imply that a threatening situation had brought them home 
but they needed help and they needed access to God to do it. If they put God first by rebuilding the altar, then He would protect them from the enemies who weren't happy about their return. If we seek His kingdom first and His righteousness, He'll take care of it. He says He'll take care of your needs. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. In other words, I'll take care of you, but don't miss it. Babylon makes us, pushes us to misplace our priorities on worldly things, on temporal things. Oh, it's more important that we do this and this. No, what's more important is what's God called you to do, and is that your highest priority in life? Now again, those are those are those are fluctuating things, right? If you're the father of young children, God's called you really to love your wife in a different way, and He's called you to raise those children up to lead your family spiritually. That may be a different calling once your kids are older and gone. And they're they're now He's saying, you know what? I need you over here to do this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. He'll let you know where the rest of it is. So we fear God more than we fear anything else in this evil world. That's the idea. A reverence for it. Um, you may have courage to stand alone. Some people have more courage than others. But the reality is, it's easier to take that sort of stand when you're gathered with a group of believers that are standing together to fight. Secondly, building God's house requires you give of resources. Look at verse... Uh, Seven, they gave money to the masons and carpenters and food, food, drink, and oil to the Sidonians and the Tyrians. Now, the question is, where'd they get the money? Now, some of it we know they brought some stuff back from Babylon. He gave them gold and gave them silver and gave, told the people along the way to help them out. But you've got to think about this in an agrarian society. Now, they've been there for a year. Did they get all their, did, did they plant everything? Did they get all their crops come in? Now they've got cash? No, I believe what you're seeing is they're sacrificially giving what they have because they had to hire somebody to do this work. They had to hire the, the, the masons and the carpenters. Right? They had to hire the skilled people to do the work, so they gave of their resources. Building God's house requires money. It also requires a willingness to give financially, but it also requires a, guilt, a willingness to give of our time and our talent and our energy. So if we're given our best time and talent, and best money to worldly things, then we're not following in what God called us to do. So the example here is it's a sacrificial type of giving. I mean, I don't know how we can take it any other way. They've uprooted themselves from Babylon. They've come there. Yes, they got some money to come along the way. They've been there set up. And what we're going to see later is things are going pretty well for them. And they've built some pretty nice houses. But unfortunately, the temple still ain't. And that becomes a problem. And we'll look at why they use excuses as to why. Well, the people here really don't want it. Right? They're doing what? They've got to stand against Babylon. Babylon says what? Don't build the temple. We don't want to build it. Uh, Babylon says um, you can't gather more than ten people and worship God in this country. Or that state. Or that county. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what you're talking about. Yep. Standing against Babylon. If you want restoration with the Lord, start with your resources. That God has been faith and be faithful in the little things, because that's what Jesus calls us to do. Uh, Luke 16, to be faithful. Building the house of God requires working in unity with godly leadership. Some examples here. Uh, okay, uh, I'm sorry. Eight, eight, working together, eight, nine, and ten, right? So they they came up with this, and they began. They appointed Levites from 20 years old to oversee the work of the house. And all who came from all who came from captivity to Jerusalem began to work. How many came up from Jerusalem and began to work? All. All began to work under what? Under the leadership of Zerubbabel and Jeshua. Then Jeshua and his sons and brothers 
and they did all these things. They did what? They oversaw the workmen of the temple. So what we have to do is we have to have godly leadership. And if Randy was here, it's like he said last week, God is a God of structure and order. That's why we have leadership within the church. So leadership comes together, leadership prays, and then we do what? We have a unified body under the leadership. We can't all go our own separate directions. We have to be unified in the direction that the church is going. Um, unity is essential because the enemy outside would shortly threaten to shut and shut down their work. We're going to see that in chapter 4. The enemy came in and actually shut down their work. The leaders wisely delegated the work so they didn't just fall on a few. And any significant work for God is the work of many members working together in harmony. Some are way out in front. Some are in the back. And that's just the way it works. And that's if God, wherever God has called you, grow where he's planted you. There is no insignificant job in God's house. None. They're all significant. Um, building God's house requires a renewed emphasis on corporate worship. A renewed emphasis. Because remember, they hadn't been corporately worshiping together when they were in Babylon. Uh, verse 11. They sang, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His loving kindness is upon Israel forever. And all the people shouted with great joy when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house was laid. You see, they all came together with a renewed emphasis. This is now corporate worship. They're coming together to do this. They sang. They praised. They gave thanks. For what? For He was good. His loving kindness is upon us forever. And the people shouted with a great shout. Now they could sing of His goodness and His covenant towards the people. Secondly, and here's the key I want us to see with this. A little bit different. Is that they expressed emotion in their praises. They shouted for joy. And they gave a loud shout. There's emotion that comes along when you do what? Now watch the emotion in verse 11. They sang, praise, and give thanks to the Lord. For the Lord is good, for His loving kindness. When I was reading this and studying, it reminds me of Jim. Jim, God's good. Circumstances, nah. But God is good. So see, he sees it. He understands it. And that's what this is. They can sing of His goodness with emotion. They weren't going back there. God is good. God is good all the time. God is good. Who wants to hear that, man? Huh? Right? Isn't that what it is? I mean, Dana used to say sometimes, he'd look out, we'd sing a song, and he'd stop and go, we're going to sing that again. Get it on your faces. Yeah. Right? Put it on your faces. Have some emotion. If God has saved you, we ought to be excited. Right? All of these things come together. Secondly, they notice it. Uh, if our focus is on great, faithful, loving, loving covenant-keeping God and the truth of His Word, it should affect our emotions. Hmm. How can you not be moved when you think about the abundant grace that He gave us? And then finally, building God's house requires a spirit of cooperation and understanding. Spirit of cooperation. I'll just call this a mix. Mix of old and young. The transition. Churches are transitioning constantly, right? And here, here's, here's the example. We see here, uh, that's in 12 and 13, right? The old men were complaining. The young men, they were just excited about what was going on. The young people were thrilled when they saw the foundation being laid. All they had ever known was Babylon. So they're looking, they're doing what? They're looking to the future. We're going to get God's temple built. The old guys are going... Well, it doesn't look as good as the one in the past. Right? When, when, when. <clears throat> All they had ever known was Babylon and it's what? Temples of idols. Now they get these. Now to remember, these young guys and these old guys had all been what? They'd been roused by God to go back. But it's the perspective. It's the perspective. We have to have a perspective of what does God have for us going forward? One of the great things that we did, I believe we did, when, when, when Conrad, when we brought Conrad in, was there's no sacred cows here. Right? As long as it's scriptural, there's no How we've done it in the past doesn't be, have to be how we've done it in the future. We, those of us that are a little bit older, those of y'all a little bit older, y'all can't get your head stuck down in the sand. This is how it's always been done. Right? 
There's changes that come. The old timers had seen something greater, and we'll talk about that later. Um, there are two pitfalls we have to be aware of. The old guys could have discouraged the younger from the rest, men from restoration. They could have discouraged them. No, this isn't very good. You should have really seen what it Okay, well, I mean, I, I, I want to move forward with that. It could have been tragic. They had to start somewhere, even though the new beginning didn't necessarily match the former glory, it was a start. The other pitfall is the young guys could have ignored the wisdom and experience of the old guys, in which case they would have made mistakes and repeated failures of the past. So see, you need a blend of that. That's why if you look, a healthy church has young, young folks and old folks and everybody in between. And if you look at a lot of dying churches, they're dying, some of them are dying because you got a bunch of old people who won't change. And then you got a bunch of growing churches that are going to have huge problems because they got a, young, a lot of young people in them that don't have the experience and wisdom to say, that doesn't work. That's been tried. All those things. We need all ages in God's church, and we have to look to learn from one another. Because here's the thing. You can have an 18-year-old that's more spiritually mature than a 70-year-old. Okay? So we, don't, we, look at, we look at maturity in, 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 in faith versus age in that. So do you need a restoration with God? Restoration with God is always possible, but must focus on the cross, obedience to His Word, and on building His house. Those three things. All right, we'll pick up in chapter four next week, and it's going to get it's going to be good. It's going to be good. It's going to be fire up. Yes, ma'am. David Jeremiah is doing a series right now called Forward, and it's just it's really interesting because it all matches up where we need to, to look. And he interviewed Sheila Walsh, and she said, "Stop looking in the rearview mirror and look through the windshield." Absolutely. And he said, "The windshield is broad." The rear mirror is small. Isn't there? But it's still there. It's still there. You need to look at it every once in a while to remember, hey, I don't want to be in that ditch again. Right. Amen? Mm -hmm. Randy Dixon, would you close us in prayer, brother?